Hello, it's David again, and let's see, where are we at today? It is in Australia. Whew. Thursday, June 1st, May 31st there in the United States. Um, today, we have another edition of Mailbag, and this is... Uh, uh, Reaching Evangelical Christians and uh, the Jeff's Times 2 <laughs> mailbag. Okay? So anyway, just got a lot of... You all are some of the most <laughs> amazing communicators I've ever come across. <laughs> you know, comments is an inappropriate term for a lot of the things you all uh, send to me or post on comments. It's like letters... <laughs> on the comments but some of it's just so good I, I just have to pass it on because I don't know if everybody reads the comments but I'm just gonna read some of these things that were posted and uh, extrapolate on it a bit and um, hopefully this will be encouraging and informative and maybe even a bit of fun for those of you that are interested and uh, there's so much of it here I think I'm gonna have to break it up into two videos uh, so anyway, let's go. Let's do it. Let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we just pray that uh, everything that uh, we say here is from you and that it would be encouraging and edifying and uh, that it would reach out to the lost and the lonely and encourage the saints. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. All right, let's see, what was the, the, the thumbnail? Reaching Evangelicals? Oh, no, that's not the one. And two Jeffs mailbag. Jeffs times two. <laughs> Jeffs times two mailbag. Um, this one's from Ethan. And he, he writes, Hey, Brother David, I have a question for you. I'm a 20-year-old lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm going on a mission somewhat soon, and my biggest fear is that I'll meet someone like Jeff Durbin. <laughs> oh, besides just reading the Bible, how can I know the Bible like you do? I really would like to know the Bible like you do. <laughs> Maybe this question would make a good video. <laughs> Thanks. I absolutely admire your testimony and story. You truly are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Anyway, here we go. Hi, Ethan. Good for you, going on mission. You are my hero. Don't be afraid of all the Jeffs. You shouldn't even try to talk to such people. Uh, not so much speaking about, you know, Pastor Jeff, but speaking about uh, Jeff Durbin. You shouldn't even try to talk to such people. You're sent, Ethan, to look for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and also for needy Gentiles. You're not sent to have sword fights with the Jeff, Dur Jeff Durbins of the world. As romantic as that might seem to be, you may have watched The Princess Bride one too many times. <laughs> oh, what a good movie. Marriage, that blessed arrangement, that dream within a dream. Oh, love, true love. <laughs> okay, calm down, David. <clears throat> Anyway, Ethan, you're sent to find the lost sheep. The primary characteristic of a lost sheep is that they're lost and alone, and they know it at least a little bit. They haven't yet found their true flock. They haven't found their people yet. They haven't found the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, and that that's what they really desire. They feel like misfits in the world, and they feel like misfits in their Christianity. If they have a religion, they know, you know, some of them don't even have a religion. But whether they're atheists or whether they have a religion, they're not all set. And they're still feeling needy for something that somehow, deep down, at least a little bit, they know they don't yet have. That's who you're looking for. The people enough for our Father to reach with his wonderful spirit. If someone's very satisfied with their religion, in my opinion, the best thing to do 
is to be kind, but keep moving. Don't waste your time. And this is a big deal. Listen, Ethan, you don't need to know the Bible like I do, okay? That would be weird and unnecessary. <laughs> oh, I hope that's comforting to some of you that you don't have to know the Bible like I do. The keystone of our faith is the Book of Mormon and trusting the Holy Ghost to convict the needy ones of its truth. And you can do that. But it is good to be able to show the needy ones who have had fear put in their hearts about the restoration by all the anti-Mormon slander, all the anti-Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints slander. It's good to be able to show the needy ones verses from the Bible that support our faith and practice. That is a very good thing to do. But you don't have to know the Bible like I do in order to do such a thing. What we need is a list of the questions that commonly come up, a list of the, the slanderous accusations that are commonly brought up, and the scriptures from the Bible that uh, support uh, our faith and practice, and the scriptures from the Bible that refute the slanderous accusations. That's all we need. Somebody has to compile such a list. And Ethan, you could be the one to do it. Or any of the people that are watching this could be the person to do it. If you just listen to my videos, take note of each subject talked about and the scriptures given in support, and if I quote the scripture, often I'll quote a scripture, I'll say, I'm not sure exactly where this is, but I'll quote the scripture. All you have to do is just take what I say and Google it, and the scripture reference will come up. Okay? It, and it doesn't have to be like if you go to a, something like Bible Gateway and you put it in, it probably won't come up because it has to be exact. But if you Google what I say, the scripture reference will come up. Okay? You can easily get the reference by simply Googling the text of the verse and the reference comes up. You or someone could do this and come up with a, even come up with a little app with each subject and all the various verses supporting the restoration and make this available to all our people and all of our missionaries. This would be a wonderful thing and I would be happy to review it and edit, to, edit it and add to it as needed. Okay? And... I can't remember who it was, but somebody uh, wrote me an email or posted something saying there's actually on the um, Gospel Library app from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints website that most of you have on your uh, smartphones these days. There's actually a feature there where you can actually, uh, a particular verse, like if someone like Jeff Durbin says, Isaiah 43.10, bam, 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 and hits you on the head with it. You can attach all those verses as a note to Isaiah 43.10 in your Gospel Library app. And all those verses, you could just go to Isaiah 43.10 and all those verses will come right up. And you can say, well, Jeff, that's, that's all well and good. But here's some verses that really explain uh, the big picture of this from Genesis to Revelation. And, and then, uh, you know, Jeff Durbin or people like Jeff Durbin, you have a way to uh, effectively... Actually, you don't even want to be debating this with Jeff Durbin. But a sincere person that has listened to Jeff Durbin and is troubled, but they're still drawn and they're humble enough to listen, you can look up Isaiah 43.10 on your Gospel Library app and click on it. And if you've put those verses in there because somebody compiled, compiled a list and you put those in there, they're all right there for you. Okay? So, God forbid... Everybody should have to know the Bible like I do. That's That would be really a waste of time. Because um, the, only, uh, the only reason why I know the Bible like I do is because I had the miserable business of having nothing, nothing spiritual in my life that was real and true except for this book. This was all I had. For 47 years. That's why I know the Bible like I do. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. And if you have, you know, 
the mountain of truth that exists in the restoration and living apostles and prophets and very busy lives like some of you have posted. You know, you're raising six children. Now you've got, you know, 35 grandchildren and 14 great, you know, and you're trying to keep up with middle class life. You, you, you don't need to do this. But it would be nice if you could speak the language of non-Latter-day Saint Christians, which is the Bible, and be able to always be ready to give an answer of the hope that you have. So it would be glorious. I'm just pleading. Somebody out there, please do this. Go through all my videos, compile a list of all the different scriptures, and add to them anything else you can think of, and, and send that to me, and I'll find a way to get it up on my site so everybody can download it and uh, add it to their gospel library app and we can all be equipped without having to live in the wilderness of evangelical christianity for 47 years with nothing real but the bible okay so anyway there you go yeah much love david thanks thanks for your wonderful letter ethan okay <laughs> all right let's see here now, boy, I'm going to have to make four of these mailbag videos. Now, this is Aileen Walker, you know, one of our dear friends here. She wrote, hey, David, quite handsome in your white shirt and tie. Actually, it was light blue, but close enough. I love that we dress up for church. It's symbolic of our desire to be better, not better than others, but better selves for, you know, there's many ways to show love and respect for God. I feel this is one of them. About anti and criticism against the church, it's a no-go zone for me. If we choose to watch it, we're opening the door for the adversary. Why should we do it? To paraphrase Elder Holland, we don't need to invite them in and serve tea and crumpets. I believe our missionaries are counseled to simply state the message, bear witness to the truth, and not contend with contenders. That's wonderful, Eileen. I'm glad you like my shirt and tie. I did that. I actually did that for everybody because I, I got back from a sacrament meeting and I knew I was going to be doing that that video, taping that interview with Luke uh, not too far. I, I, I was going to take off my shirt and then I was like, no, people would probably like to see that I can actually look halfway civilized. <laughs> so I left it on deliberately. So I'm glad that you appreciated it, Eileen. And then um, Linda Martinez, she said, your shirt and tie look so nice. LOL. Lots of laughs. Like a true member. <laughs> yes, we are very attacked by them. Love how you stick up for precious truths. Okay, and then this was my reply to her. Hi, Linda. Oh, I'd already said this, but there we go. I'd just gotten home from sacrament meeting and stuff and had taken off my jacket and was about to take off my shirt and tie and get back in my normal clothes. And the Holy Ghost admonished me. Leave it on. Here's your chance for your friends to see you look as they do when you go to sacrament. And I was like, yes. I hadn't worn a tie in 20 years. Once I started attending the ward, even before I was baptized, I realized I was going to a meeting to honor the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on my behalf. And I should dress to honor him like I would if I was going to his funeral. Even though he was resurrected, because he plainly said at the Last Supper, he said, as often as you do this, speaking of celebrating the sacrament, he says, as often as you do this, you're remembering the death of the Lord until he comes again. So I just realized, even though it doesn't come very easy to me to dress up, that I should really dress as if I was going to the funeral of the most amazing person on earth. Okay, so actually... I got myself a suit and tie. I didn't even own a suit and tie, just like I didn't even own a laptop or a smartphone. I still don't have a smartphone. But now I have two jackets. I actually wear a jacket, suits and ties. And you know what else? I heard uh, I heard that story about uh, the two counselors to President Nelson, how they were eating in the, the canteen or whatever. And... Um, President Nelson crushed his water bottle, so the other two crushed their water crushed their water water bottles, not mindlessly following him, but following him with intelligence, because really that is what 
Paul said. He said, the things you've learned and seen and heard in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. He said, you know, he said, I beg you, imitate me. Follow me as I follow Christ. So you know what I did? When I first started meeting with the sister missionaries, I had a beard, a big kind of a rough looking beard. You wouldn't have picked me up if I was hitchhiking. Not that you would now, but in any case, you know, I was like, I hadn't even seen my face in 22 years. And I was like, I should shave this off. Just in honor of President Nelson and the other general authorities. You know, not 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 mindlessly, but I'm like, look at them. They're glorious. And I, I looked at the group picture in the Leahona magazine of all the general authorities. Not one of them had a beard. I was like, well, I know I can't have a beard, but, you know. His two counselors, they're apostles, and they crushed their water, bo water bottles. I can shave my beard. Then I'd know whether I still have a chin and, and whether I have one or two. So I went ahead and shaved my beard and, and did it joyfully. Okay? So this is, uh, there's nothing wrong. It, we're, we're actually supposed to follow our leaders as they follow Christ. Not that everybody has to shave their beard, but. The Holy Ghost spoke to my heart to shave my beard. I guess it was a bit of a little tiny test. Are you willing to shave your beard? I know you've given up coffee, but what about your beard? Are you willing to shave your beard so you can look like President Nelson? I was like, yes, of course. Why not? <laughs> I love it. I just love it. I love having people to follow, man, that are worthy of following. What a joy. Okay. Apostles and prophets to listen to and take seriously and follow and cling to. Such a joy. Okay, this is from Andre. Next one. Watching that missionary talk to that preacher reminds me of this scripture and prophecy in Doctrine and Covenants 1. That the weak things of the world will come forth and preach the gospel to the ends of the world. We shouldn't be embarrassed that the missionaries aren't more equipped with rhetoric and argument to talk back to people like this. They speak in the name of God. And then he cuts and pastes Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 1, verse 17 to 23. And I, I just thought this was excellent. Listen to this. He says, Wherefore, I, the Lord, knowing the calamity that should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith Jr. and spake unto him from heaven and gave him commandments and also gave commandments to others that they should proclaim these things unto the world and all this that it might be fulfilled which was written by the prophets. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones that man should not counsel his fellow man neither trust in the arm of flesh but that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord even the Savior of the world that faith also might increase in the earth, that mine everlasting covenant might be established, that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. Also remember that Jesus himself chose ordinary men who were mere fishermen from Galilee to confound the trained Pharisees and Sanhedrin of his day. See, I love that. I love our Father's way. I love his way. I, I just got to read this little thing. This is, uh, that's what Joseph Smith wrote. And this is just an example of how the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, how much it confirms what's in the Bible. It doesn't contradict it. It confirms it if it's rightly understood. But this is what uh, Paul writes. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, among many. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's see, Acts, Romans, I'm almost there, Corinthians. He says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Where is Jeff Durbin? <laughs> where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks 
foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now listen to this. This is so beautiful. This is an exact parallel to what Joseph Smith, you know, what, what uh, the revelation gives Joseph Smith in Doctrine and Covenants 1. For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things. God has chosen the losers that live in their vans <laughs> and wandered around in the wilderness for 47 years before they finally looked under the last possible rock and found what they've been looking for all their life. <laughs> God chose the complete failures who couldn't find a way to bear fruit that remained for their entire lives. And now just live in their van along the Australia coast <laughs> to, to just somehow confound the wise. You know? God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things, that means the lowly, the lowly, it says in the King James, the lowly things of the world and the things that are despised, God has chosen. And the things that are nothing to bring to nothing, the things that think they're something, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories let him glory in the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So beautiful. So that, that's an exact parallel. You know? So, so wonderful, that section from Doctrine and Covenants 1 that that, that fellow posted. All right, now here's a couple of good ones, okay? God's offspring posted. Many Christians think God is our father in the same way that Frankenstein is the father of his creation. The rub is, evangelicals and other superstitious Christians have created an unknowable monster out of God. You know, I know that's going to be offensive to many Christians, but I think it's true. I was actually taught that, that uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, I was taught in the second grade of my parochial Catholic school, being raised in a devout Catholic family, they had this whole arcane formula for the Trinity. God is not God is the first person, second person, third person. God is equal to the, the Son, is equal to the Holy Spirit, is equal to the Father. Uh, <clears throat> what is the other one? Um, God is not the uh, Son, is not the Holy Spirit, is not the Father. You know, all, a triangle within a circle. Sounds a bit Masonic to me, like a Masonic symbol of some kind. But in any case, and then, so we have this precise formula that we have to give intellectual assent to. But we're also taught at the same time, one of the fundamental things that I was taught was that this was an incomprehensible mystery. In other words, it's completely unknowable. But of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, look, God's your father. <laughs> you know, he's your father. He's daddy, man. And if, if you receive me by receiving the ones I've sent, and you receive the Holy Ghost, you know, then uh, you receive the spirit of adoption by which you cry out, Abba, Father. And God's actually your daddy. You're born of God. You become a sharer in the divine nature. He's not a knowable. You can know him just, be, just as your father. Not a knowable at all. We're supposed to know him in the same way that a child knows their earthly father and our heavenly father thinks of us in exactly the same way that an earthly father thinks of his children on his very best day, his very best moment of his very, very best day. And that that's, you know, and then in terms of what he looks like, it can't be any clearer than Genesis 1, in the image and likeness of God, God made them male and female, he, he created them, in the image and likeness of God. So we know exactly what he looks like, unless you're too smart and sophisticated to actually just believe what the word of God says. 
okay? When you see Heavenly Father, guess what? He's going to look just like Adam, and he's going to have a woman by his side, just like Adam had Eve by his side. That's what the Bible says, all right? All right, so just to repeat what God's awesome. Many Christians think God is our Father, like Frankenstein is the father of his creation. The rub is evangelicals and other superstitious Christians have created an unknowable monster out of God. And then Catherine Beter posted this. She said, I feel like they think our Father in Heaven is creating pets. And see, I actually brought that up in my video. It's like, it's like non-Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint Christianity. It's schizophrenic. I mean, I, I was taught to pray the rosary. I can't tell you how many thousands of times. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're supposed to know him and pray to him as our Father. We're supposed to know that his, his only begotten Son is actually our older brother. We're actually children of God. And somehow you're supposed to believe all that. But at the same time, believe that God is something utterly other than you. He's, he's of a completely different species. We, we are like, he's like way up here, just beyond, you know, if my arm was a hundred miles long, God would be higher than that. And I'm down here just, you know, just on a good day, I'm, I've got my feet planted on the dirt and I'm, I'm just some much incredibly lower creature of a completely different kind and sort than my father is which is just whacked because you know the whole the whole character of god that he built into all created living things is that what things father things according to their kind you know if something's a father of something what it fathers is of the same species that it is it's of the same kind that it is and and it says in romans 1 that we're supposed to know our heavenly father by the things that he has made and that's the most fundamental thing that he has built into every living thing and so uh, i like what she says here she says i feel like the evangelical christians or you know other christians they think our father in heaven is creating pets he loves us and we love him but will we always have four legs and slobber <laughs> Yes, yes. Are we, are we, are we all going to have four? Le always have four legs and slobber. That's the extent of our value. <laughs> you know, we might, we might like stop slobbering and and maybe be like a dog that just had a good bath and has learned not to slobber and learned not to, you know, has has learned to poo in the litter box like a cat or something. And then God's like, okay, you know, I've cleaned them up. And that God's just calling us his children uh, to kind of like boost our self-esteem or something, you know? It's just weird. It's just weird. Let's just believe the Bible, okay? Is that all right for me to believe the Bible and, and not have you evangelical Christians and charismatic Christians and not Latter-day Saint Christians think I'm going to go into the that my my father in heaven is going to throw me into a pit of fire to be tormented for all eternity because i actually believe he's my father is that okay i think it should be okay if you want if you want to be weird and not believe it that's okay with me i mean i, I don't think our father is going to torture you for all eternity for, for not actually believing completely what you pay lip service to but I don't, do, I don't want to just pay lip service to the idea that God's my Father. It's in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that he wants a family. He wants his only begotten Son to be the firstborn of many brothers who are just like him. You know, he, he wants us to sit down with him in his throne, on his throne with the Lord Jesus Christ, because we overcome like he did, and we sit down with Jesus, who's sitting down with our Father. He wants us to be joint heirs with his son he wants us to receive all the glory that he received is that okay i think it should be okay i don't think he always wants us to have four legs and slobber okay i mean there's there's a pair a little bit of a parallel to this which i brought up in in one of the videos it's like at one point heavenly father speaking rhetorically or you know figuratively to jacob when jacob is hasn't demonstrated he has back he says you worm jacob 
But of course, Jacob wasn't in that. And then after Jacob wrestled all night with the angel, our father's like, okay, I'm changing your name to Israel, one who prevailed with God. All right, you qualify. Okay, but he wants us all to qualify. Jacob stopped slobbering and went from having no back down, backbone to having backbone. And God said, okay, now you're, now you're Israel. You prevailed with God and you're going to rule and reign with me. Okay, let's see. Let's see how long. Wow, it's already, I've already gone a half an hour with this stuff. I've just begun, I'm telling you what. Okay, Aileen Walker. She posts a lot, and good for her. Just, It's wonderful that people just express what's in their heart. David, you said you have to speak out, or your head would explode. <laughs> and that reminded me of Luke chapter 19, verse 40. And then, and some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. <laughs> oh, I guess you can make a parallel there, Aileen. That was funny. Good for you. Now, let's see here. Okay, Lee Universe posted this. Yep. I grew up in many religions. I was born and baptized Catholic. And I'd read the Bible for myself, not being programmed by any particular religion to look at the Bible in a certain way. I'd read it, and I'd see for myself that these religions were not following what the Bible actually said in many things, in their key doctrines. They were cherry-picking. They were misrepresenting. And they were ignoring key principles, some of the biggest. I came upon the LDS Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's not good to use abbreviations. And it was the only religion that in full and accurately so believed and practiced what the Bible said in all respects. Yes! Yes! This is exactly my experience. I had to join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I actually found the one church on earth that are actually Bible believers, <laughs> you know? And he says, he goes on, he says, and yeah, it's a flaw in the church that we just learn the gospel, the good news, and that's what we share and understand in simple joy, but aren't generally biblicists. So when we encounter anti-Mormons, we often don't know how to answer them because we aren't experienced enough either with the scriptures or with their tactics. And, um, it is a bit of a flaw, but everybody doesn't have to be a biblicist, like I've already said. You know, if we're just filled with the Holy Ghost, and we have our testimony, and we pay attention, we take ownership of our testimony, and we just be glad to listen, and then once we listen to what they say, we just bear witness to the truth from our heart. It's helpful if they if they bring up certain things they have problems with. They have like the Gospel Library app and a few scriptures to set their hearts at peace and then simply express from our heart in the power of the Holy Ghost our testimony and encourage them to, to seek our Father, to be humble and really pray about what they've heard and ask the Spirit of truth if it be true. And then just let the Holy Ghost and the truth stand on its own. And so, you know, we don't have to be biblicist, but, but we are supposed to always be ready to give as an effective an answer as we can of the hope that we have. So there's a balance there. You know, we don't want to just say, oh, I can't be a biblicist. So, but no, we can do what we can to always be ready to give an effective answer of the hope that we have with meekness and fear. Then Kim Houghton, she posted this. I'm so glad to see this conversation with Luke. Luke's amazing. This two-part video is amazing. Discussing insights as, as how to lovingly walk away from those who are not sincere but only interested in making money by publicly, publicly beating us over the head. I guess it's a more modern version of the violence of old. Instead of torches, they come bearing cameras. We cannot allow ourselves as missionaries or otherwise to become fodder for their YouTube channel machinations of the devil. Much love, Kim. Okay. And then I just wanted to add to what Kim said here. Kim, what messes with the Bible 
is when people like Jeff Durbin use the living word of God according to letter, not according to spirit. For the Bible itself says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified by people who thought they were doing God's service and cast him out as evil and actually tortured him to death, justifying themselves by the letter of the scriptures. As it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, this is how we need to be, that God also wants to make us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And so this is, this is uh, kind of the goal, is that we'd be spiritual enough when we have conversations with people, whether they're evangelical Christians or atheists or whoever they might be, you know, Catholics, Orthodox, anybody, uh, that we'd be able to speak by the Spirit of truth in the power of the Holy Ghost and just not take thought for what we'll say, but just trust the Holy Ghost to give us the words to speak of our out of the abundance of our testimony. We have to have our testimony stored up in our heart. Because what's in the well comes up in the bucket, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So we, we have to have our hearts filled. We have to feast on the words of Christ and have our hearts filled with our testimony and and of a, a ready answer for the hope that we have. And then we just share, according to the leading of the Holy Ghost, what the Holy Ghost gives us to say. And so this isn't, it's not supposed to be an intellectual exercise at all. And if somebody tries to engage us in debate on an intellectual level, I, I'm just not going to go there. I, I don't have anything to say. You know, I say, you know, um, I just told you. I just bore witness to the truth that's in my heart. And, and really, you know, you should just take it to the spirit of truth. Cry out to Heavenly Father and to the spirit of truth and to the Lord Jesus Christ that if it's true, that the Holy Ghost would bear witness to the truth in your heart. And if you're not humble enough to do that, I really don't have anything else to say to you right now. But have a lovely day. Appreciate you. Thanks for talking with me. All right. And then, uh, let's see here. Okay. Then, um, Brandon. Brandon posted this. He said, hey, David, I have a question for you. First, however, I want to say thank you for your beautiful testimony. I love listening to your videos and have shared them with many. Your love for the Lord and pursuit of truth are really inspiring. As a fellow Latter-day Saint, I can say you have taught me much and shared a sweet spirit that's blessed my life and helped deepen my love of the Savior. Now to my question. There's some, particularly in the rationalistic atheistic community, so this video is a response to my, um, my video about, uh, you know, torturing, you know, the Christians torturing the sincere Christendom. Who would see the situation you described in this video, the martyrdom of dissenting believers, as evidence of not necessarily the evils of apostate Christendom, but the evils of fundamental religious belief in general. How did you come to see these evils without losing your faith in religion? and the idea of pursuing a true gospel altogether? It's a very good question, isn't it? Because really, if someone j doesn't look at the rest restored church, if they just look at the historical testimony of non-Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint Christianity, it doesn't inspire faith, okay? It doesn't inspire saving faith. So anyway, this is my answer. Because when I heard, when Jesus Christ died for my sins, and for those of the whole world, that the Lord Jesus Christ died, even for those who were torturing him to death, I was cut to the heart. I saw how selfish and evil I was. To me, this was so beautiful, what he did, that it made me want to change and be like him. 
And when I read of people in detail, not some fairy tale or cartoonish versions of martyrdom, my reaction is exactly the same. That man whose letter I read, what a beautiful human being. His sacrifice and witness to the truth humbles me, inspires me, and convicts me and makes me want to change and be like him. It doesn't hurt my faith. His example builds my faith. It was the same thing when I read the book Saints, you know, the first volume of the, the history of the Latter-day Saints. It's come out in the last few years, and then I've read half the second volume. When I read that, I want to be like those people. Their example builds my faith. Their faith was real enough to, to cause them to desire to give all for the one who gave all for them. If people who had true faith were all jerks and demons, like the religious people who torture and demonize others because they're so sure of their own rightness, just as the Jews did with Jesus, well, that would destroy my faith. But those with true faith are not like that. Those with true faith are the happy people who, even though relaxed and non-judgmental, non believe the best and have simple righteousness, peace, and joy. So that's what inspires true faith in me, and that's what I've found in the church, the true church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I found the happy people, and they have inspired true faith in me and allowed me to begin to become the man I have desired to be my entire adult life but never found the power to become. So... I owe a debt of love that I'm going to spend the rest of my life paying, and gladly so. Okay? Now, let's see. I'm going to read one more here, and then uh, I'll probably do a second version of this. Okay? This is uh, about lack of unspokenness. This is a, something posted by Fighting for Truth. He says, as a lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I can tell you a major reason for the lack of outspoken Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints apologist content is because we have a culture of wanting to fit in. This is where our niceness may go too far. I think all the decades of being hated has made many of us extra sensitive to trying to stand up for our beliefs so as not to poke the hornet's nest even more. But I 100% agree we need to stop being so timid about defending our faith and defending our past prophets and beliefs. We need to stop being ashamed of it. And then he quotes 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which I, I don't know what that is. So let's look that up. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. He says... Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. See, this is, this is profound, what this fighting for truth has posted here. It, it's like that spirit of fear, it comes to us. It, it isn't like a, an outright, full-on fear, but anxiety and intimidation just to cause us to shut our mouths and not open our mouths and boldly bear witness to the truth because we're a bit intimidated and a bit anxious about stirring up the hornet's nest. Well, we can't be that way. We can't be that way. It's the end of the age. We have to overcome that. And, I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ in one place, he says, look, he says, uh, you know, he who acknowledges me before men, and you could say he who acknowledges, he who proclaims his testimony before men, you know, he who acknowledges before men, I'll acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. So we can't let the evil one intimidating us in being ashamed of our testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, his marvelous atonement, and the restoration of his church. You know, that's just a shame that we would allow ourselves to be intimidated. And I think I think um, fighting for truth has hit the nail on the head there. I think it's easy for it. Okay. And let's see. 
Shall you do one more? Okay. Now this is a put put by Phil Andrews in response to the thing about Apologia's uh, Jeff's videos. He says, thanks for sharing. Out of curiosity, this is what I was afraid would happen. He says, out of curiosity, I actually watched that video that Luke brought up, which Apologia Utah put out in response to David's testimony. And oddly, they state right at the beginning, see, I haven't even watched that. They put it out about me. I haven't even watched. I'm not going to, man. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna click on any of their stuff. Why would I? That's just nuts. But just like I was afraid of, Phil, out of curiosity, actually watch that video Luke brought up, which Apologia Utah put out in response to David's testimony. And oddly, they state right at the beginning they haven't even watched any of David's videos. And then they proceed to spend well over an hour commenting on something they haven't even watched. They simply cherry-pick a few short clips from David's testimony, so they must have watched at least that much, and then go into the same old anti-Latter-day Saint rhetoric and arguments we've heard over and over again from evangelical Christians who waste time bashing our faith, i.e. totally misunderstanding our beliefs, taking quotes out of context, cherry-picking, fault-finding, etc., it was a waste of time to watch it, actually. Oh, well, hello, Phil. I told you it would be. <laughs> it was a waste of time to watch it, actually, and I much prefer listening to more positive and uplifting videos, or else clean humor. However, I suppose it's instructive to be aware of what's going on, and I did leave a comment there for what it's worth. And, of course, what it's worth, Phil, is not much. <laughs> And then this is my response, right, my response to Phil. Phil, curiosity, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, this is just my opinion, for a son of God is never a valid reason to do anything. We're only supposed to do what we have faith to do. Inspired by the Holy Ghost, as Jesus said, I do nothing of myself, I only do what I see the Father doing. That's the standard. Of course, we all fall short of that high standard. But in the case of YouTube, wow, it's so dangerous. So many saints, I think, go on there and wander around watching and listening to stuff because they're curious and because it's there. <laughs> but really, it's like wandering around in a minefield and poking at everything because you're curious. <laughs> Curiosity killed the cat is a proverb for good reason. And it can kill you if you're not real careful. Much love, David. Whew. Anyway, I think we'll stop this mailbag video. I don't know how much appetite people have for this mailbag stuff. But, um, you know, I mean, I have to do these mailbag videos even if not very many people watch them. Because the, the things that you respond with, are, it's just so marvelous. I, I'm going to have to do a whole other one right after I finish with this one. Because it's so marvelous. You know, the things I say spark things in you, and the things you say spark things in me. And and this is really what it's talking about. Uh, and, and, you know, then other people come and look in on this, and they're inspired. And then they're inspired, and they pass it on, and they pass it on. This is why it says in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, you know, it seems like an impossible dream that we could attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we could grow up into him in all things. But it's actually, from what it says there, it's very simple. It says, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up into him in all things, even Christ. Okay? So, you know, that's how we're going to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And just like it says in, in Malachi, I think chapter 4, it says that those who feared the Lord, they spoke often to one another, and a book of remembrance was written of those who feared the Lord and called upon his name. And uh, so, you know, there's angels up there. You know, we pour out our testimony. That builds your testimony. You pour out the, what that stirs in you. I pour out what that stirs in me. And we go back and forth and back and forth. And you know what? We're a little bit more like the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Isn't that amazing? That's just so amazing. And you all are like so responsive. It's just like mind blowing to me how responsive you are to what's in my heart and and how what's in your heart calls out more of what's in my heart it's like deep calling to deep calling to deep calling to deep it's a glorious thing it's such a glorious thing it's not a small thing and so that's why i have to do these mailbag videos because uh the things that i read that that what i what i post calls out of you that really strike a chord in me i have to pour it back and then you can pour it back and i can pour it back and line upon line, precept upon precept on the covenant path, we take a little, another few baby steps towards becoming just like Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? See, even, even a child can do that. Even a, a broken uh, man who has spent his entire adult life trying to bear fruit for God and utterly failed in as many times and ways and places as a human being can possibly fail, I think. I failed to bear fruit that remained. Was deeply hurt and deeply hurt others. Was never able to do it. And now here somehow, you know, somehow our fathers rescued me and brought me under the covenant path with you. And I can bear fruit. What I pour out bears fruit in you. And what you pour out bears fruit in me and we pass it back and forth and there's a feast here that others can join in and find faith and come onto the covenant path with us it's such a beautiful thing i mean i'm in awe i'm absolutely in awe of all of you and absolutely in awe of the incredibly great salvation that has been given to us through the restoration of the gospel of jesus christ on the covenant path of the restored church of the lord jesus christ of the true saints in the last days. So with that in mind, how can we not sing a song? We have to sing a song. Let's see here. I found my pick. Remember a few days ago, I lost my pick. I found it. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to sing this twice. Try and sing along. The second time, you should be able to join in with me a little. It's a very simple song. We worship you, our glorious King, our Maker and Redeemer. Worthy are you to be on the throne, reigning in our hearts. Full of loving kindness, merciful and true. You are salvation, Lord Jesus Christ. Lamb of Heavenly Father, our brother and Savior. You're the bread of life. We hunger no more. You're the water life, filling our souls with your love. We worship you, our glorious King, our Maker and Redeemer. Worthy are you to be on the throne. Reigning in our hearts, full of loving kindness, merciful and true. You are salvation, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of Heavenly Father, our brother and Savior. You're the bread of life. We hunger no more, you're the water of life, filling our souls with your love. Let's pray. I don't know what's going on with um, Elder Holland.
Jeffrey Holland, his health. But um, I think it was during conference I heard that, you know, he had, he, he had had to go into dialysis or something, and he'd been relieved of his duties in the Quorum of Twelve. And, you know, obviously his health is not doing well. I don't know his situation. If anybody does know his situation, please let me know, because I want to pray intelligently. Um, and then, of course, President Nelson, you know, it's become, he made it uh, plain that he's now, uh, you know, using a walker and having some problems with his balance uh, at times. So I just, you know, if I was in their shoes, I'd want them to pray for me. <laughs> so we need to pray for them. But Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for who you are and this incredible covenant path you've given to us where we can uh, build one another up and speak the truth and love to one another and that you've made a way for this to happen throughout the earth through this miracle of YouTube and the Internet. It's just such a precious thing that we can encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest any of us be hardened through the deceitful to sin. Because it says we become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And that's what we all want to do. We want to be faithful to the end. To hold on to our apostolic and prophetic leaders. To be faithful to stay in the center of the covenant path. And make progress towards fulfilling everything that's in your heart for us to be. And so we just ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you just help us to be true purify our hearts, help us to be everything you need us to be, and we just lift up President Nelson and uh, Elder Jeffrey Holland, and we just ask that you would just strengthen them, body, soul, and spirit, encourage them, touch them in their physical bodies, heal them. Heavenly Father, we just ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Ghost, we just ask that you would heal them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Thanks so much. I'm probably going to just uh, stop this one and then start another one. So anyway, your, your comments, your letters are so marvelous. I have to respond to them. So anyway, love you all. Bye-bye.